Military muscle on the move. U.S. gunships and hundreds of Marines get ready to join the battle to finish off the Taliban leadership and its foreign terrorists. A possible new case of inhalation anthrax, this time in Connecticut. Ten weeks after the Twin Towers fell, danger still rises from the rubble. And President Bush puts out the welcome mat for tourists, but locks the front door. This is the CBS Evening News, with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. In Afghanistan tonight, thousands of hardcore Taliban fighters and their Arab terrorist allies remain surrounded in the northern city of Kunduz. They have been given additional time to surrender, while the U.S. sends in more troops and more firepower into the northern war zone, including huge flying gunships to support anti-Taliban ground forces. On the political front, leaders of Afghanistan's various factions and ethnic groups bowed to U.S. pressure, agreeing to at least discuss cooperating in a post-Taliban government. We have reports tonight from CBS News correspondents on the battlegrounds inside Afghanistan and at the Pentagon, where David Martin begins with an overview. For the first time, the U.S. has been given permission to put combat aircraft, specifically AC-130 gunships, into a base in Uzbekistan, just a short flight away from Kanduz, the last Taliban stronghold in northern Afghanistan. An estimated two to 3,000 hardcore followers of Osama bin Laden are dug in at Kanduz and giving every indication they intend to fight to the death. At the moment, it would appear that they would not intend to surrender or necessarily to give up fighting. The opposition forces which have Kanduz surrounded are still trying to negotiate a surrender, and the U.S. has promised to hold its fire if it will help the negotiations. And I think that it would be fair to say that if the opposition groups were to ask us not to bomb a specific facility or a location so they could continue their discussions, we'll certainly honor that. But Defense Secretary Rumsfeld said again today the U.S. is dead set against any deal that allows the fighters bin Laden brought into the country to escape. It would be most unfortunate if the foreigners in Afghanistan, the Al-Qaeda and the Chechens and others who have been there working with the Taliban, if those folks were uh, set free. And the Pentagon announced more American soldiers will soon be moving into northern Afghanistan to pave the way for future humanitarian assistance operation. And that work may include engineers for road repairs and explosive ordnance details to clear mines and booby traps. And combat troops as well. A force of 1,500 Marines off the coast of Pakistan could fly into Afghanistan within the next several days as the U.S. steps up the hunt for bin Laden. And there are longer range plans for sending in several hundred airborne troops from the U.S. Although bin Laden and the Taliban seem to be in dire straits, there is no sign the U.S. military campaign is easing up. If anything, it is still growing in both size and intensity. Dan? David Martin reporting live from the Pentagon. In the northern battle zone, this was a relatively quiet day as leaders of the anti-Taliban United Front thought through how and when to attack if they can't negotiate a surrender. This could be a decisive battle, as CBS's Byron Pitts reports from just behind the front lines on the road to Kanduz. For the first time in days, the bombings were kept to a minimum in northern Afghanistan. With winter fast approaching, United Front troops along the front seem worried more about warmth than war, as their commanders continued negotiations with Taliban leaders both sides in search of a peaceful like end to this battle over Kanduz. How much longer would you negotiate before you use force to remove the Taliban? We will give the Taliban a few more days, says United Front General Dahoud, adding either they surrender or we will kill them. There is no shortage of death or brutality here. The Taliban shot this United Front soldier and then set his body on fire. He was the younger brother of one of the United Front's leading generals. And according to refugees still scrambling out of Kanduz, the number of Afghan Taliban executed by those foreign Taliban loyal to Osama bin Laden is now up to 470. The United Front has agreed to allow local Taliban troops to walk out safely, but not the foreigners. 
Tonight, there are still several thousand Taliban troops and al-Qaeda guerrillas pinned down in Kunduz. They've agreed to surrender if the United Front will guarantee their safe passage out of Afghanistan. To which the United Front has responded, we do not negotiate with criminals and terrorists. Either surrender and go on trial or die where you stand. Byron Pitts, CBS News, on the road to Kunduz. However long it takes to complete the Taliban's destruction, the leaders of Afghanistan's many factions and ethnic groups are now looking to the future. And under pressure from the United States and the United Nations, they agreed today to begin talking about planning that future together next week in Berlin. CBS's Elizabeth Palmer reports tonight from the Afghan capital of Kabul. It's been rough going, but finally there's a deal on talks designed to forge a transitional government in Afghanistan. Sitting at the table beside the United Front will be representatives of Afghanistan's 86-year-old former king, Zahir Shah, and representatives of the majority Pashtun ethnic group. Conspicuously absent from the talks will be the Taliban. Earlier today, United Nations envoy Frances Vendrell tried to reassure Afghanistan's major ethnic group, the Pashtuns, that the talks would secure them a role in Afghanistan's future. This meeting will be important as a signal that there is no intention for, by anybody to consider that they have acquired legitimacy by force of arms. But the United Front and its commanders have already taken two-thirds of this country by force of arms. Afghanistan's violent history shows those same commanders would rather fight than share their power. The United Front's foreign minister, Abdullah Abdullah, believes this time, though, war-weary Afghans will force the commanders to cooperate. If one or two uh, doesn't want to do that, he will be isolated. There is enough pressure from the grassroots to create that system and to end up, uh, to put an end uh, to, to the old structure. The United Front has not ruled out the possibility of a multinational force here, but the question of who would oversee the power sharing is still a very sensitive one, and it's quite clear the United Front doesn't like the idea of foreigners policing the peace. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, Kabul. Even as their old enemies began planning a future without them, leaders of the Taliban put on a show of confidence today in Afghanistan's southern province of Kandahar. The region is home to the Pashtun ethnic group, and as CBS's Alan Pizzi reports tonight, for now it is also still Taliban territory. The southern end of Kandahar province may be the Taliban's last stronghold, but from all outward appearances it remains very much under their control. There have been rumors of U.S. special forces operating here, but Taliban officials who allowed a contingent of foreign journalists in claim that is simply not possible. Nor is the Taliban making a deal with Pashtun tribal leaders to hand over power, according to a Taliban foreign ministry spokesman. There are no negotiations, Najibullah Sherzar Akun says, adding that the Taliban will talk with anyone who wants to do things their way. Tens of thousands of refugees are the only obvious sign that things aren't going the Taliban's way. Huddled in sprawling, filthy tent camps along the road, unable to enter nearby Pakistan, they receive almost no outside assistance, according to local officials, who say the refugees fled American bombing. Taliban officials acknowledge the U.S. bombing drove their forces from other areas of Afghanistan, but a local security chief described the retreat as logistical. We do not think we are defeated, Mullah Muhammad Saeed Haqqani says, and we are not fighting for power, but for Islam. Even if the war goes badly in Kandahar province, the Taliban here say, they will take to the mountains and fight to the last. Taliban officials here insist they have no idea where Osama bin Laden is, and as for Taliban spiritual leader Mullah Muhammad Omar, he is in Kandahar, they say, and has no intention of leaving. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Spinbaldak, Afghanistan. The bodies of four journalists killed yesterday near Jalalabad, Afghanistan, were recovered today and returned to the city. The four were shot by unidentified gunmen who ambushed their convoy in a narrow pass on the road to Kabul. They include an Afghan and an Australian working for the Reuters news agency and two newspaper reporters from Spain and Italy. There may be a new case of inhalation anthrax. This time it's a woman in Connecticut and federal health officials are moving fast to come up with a definitive answer. 
CBS News medical correspondent Elizabeth Callaghan is here with late details on this. Elizabeth. Well, Dan, just like the case of New York City hospital worker Kathy Nguyen, who died of inhalation anthrax three weeks ago, this latest suspected case seems to have come out of the blue. The victim, listed in critical condition, is an elderly woman from rural Connecticut with no obvious connections or links to other sites or people where anthrax has been found. According to Connecticut Governor John Rowland, the woman had been hospitalized since last Wednesday and was initially thought to have pneumonia. But five separate tests for anthrax conducted by the hospital and state health department have come back positive so far. Testing done by the Centers for Disease Control remains the gold standard, however, and until CDC testing is complete, this is still only a suspected case. Members of the CDC are now looking at specimens, and they hope to have results within 24 hours. Dan? Elizabeth Calvin, thanks. Here in New York, yet another sad record is being set in the smoldering ruins of the World Trade Center. No other building site has ever burned this long. And as CBS's Lee Cowan reports tonight, concern is growing about possible toxins in the smoke. Exactly 10 weeks to the day in the middle of 16 acres of death. What still survives in this blackened wasteland are the fires, the smell, and the smoke. It's constant smoke. And For Catherine McVeigh-Hughes, it's her new unwelcome neighbor. You know, this is the view out her living room window, just one block from the site. It's a view she can now literally taste. Often when I come into the apartment, I, um, my, uh, uh, it's harder for me to breathe. And um, I had a cough that lasted for seven weeks. And She's tried everything, sealing her windows with tape, closing all the vents, even buying two industrial-sized air purifiers. But living this close to the nation's longest burning building fire, filters that are supposed to last two years only last two weeks. So even... Even right. with all your windows sealed and all your air yes. conditioning, everything sealed off, you still have this much dust. In dust, there. right. Both city and state health officials continue to monitor the quality of the air, and they insist that it is safe. But nobody knows just how long these fires will burn. The earliest guess, at least another six more weeks, well into the new year. I know it's hard to believe, but again, you have to get back to the intensity of that fire. Mike Carter was there that day and remembers what the air was like then, filled with the incinerated remains of computers, office furniture, carpet glue, and plastic piping. For about a minute, I thought I was gonna suffocate. Um, it was like breathe, trying to breathe in a bucket full of sand. Today, deep in the rubble, firefighters can still see I-beams glowing red, a virtual furnace some environmentalists fear could belch out chemicals and heavy metals, especially during the winter months. We get a, a stagnating, weather system, a high pressure cell sitting over New York, that levels might rise again back up to where they were earlier. But for those determined to recover the remains of those still buried in the smoldering rubble, a risk they can't see is one they're willing to take. Lee Cowan, CBS News, New York. Coming up next here on the CBS Evening News, more fallout from September 11th. The White House, the People's House, declared off limits to tourists.
There is growing debate tonight about how to promote tourism in this country while at the same time taking steps to prevent terrorism. The controversy over where to draw the line has now reached the president and the White House tour line, as CBS's John Roberts reports. The theme for Christmas at the White House is home for the holidays. Yet for anyone hoping to visit the People's House this year, the advice from the administration today, stay home. I know a lot of Americans look forward to to a tour in the White House during this period of time, but we're in extraordinary times. And as I said yesterday, evil knows no holiday. Not since the Truman era renovation has the White House been closed to the public for an extended period of time. Rare is the occasion that so many Christmas decorations will be seen by so few. The White House says the ongoing risk of terrorism is just too high, and some people uh -huh. seem to agree. My house is not a, ter a terrorist target, and I think his house is. So I really don't blame him at all. But D.C. congressional delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton says it sends the wrong message to America. It's a consistent message that the district is closed for tourism and for business, that official Washington is closed. You can't get a tour of the White House. You can't get a tour of the Capitol. The holiday shutdown stands in sharp contrast to the president's repeated calls for the nation to get back to normal. Tomorrow, he'll star in a $12 million ad campaign, urging Americans to defy terrorism and see the sights. Take your family. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. The way we, the way want, we want, it want it to be enjoyed. D.C. officials have jumped on the promotional bandwagon, pairing up Washington's mayor with celebrities from Hollywood's White House, hoping to woo tourists back to salvage a shattered economy. But there may be little for tourists to see. Even the annual lighting of the national Christmas tree, which was decorated today, has been restricted. Advance tickets only, and they've been gone for six weeks. The White House will still be open to invited guests, but the most that the general public will see of this year's Christmas decorations is when the official White House Christmas tree arrives by a horse-drawn carriage next Wednesday. Dan? John Roberts reporting live from the White House. In Louisville, Kentucky, doctors report the first recipient of a self-contained mechanical heart has suffered a new setback. 59-year-old Robert Tools, who got the heart in July, has had bleeding in his brain. It's related to a stroke Tools had 10 days ago that left him partially paralyzed. CBS Next, Eye on America. The rising cost of protecting the country from terrorists.
Promoting patriotism this holiday season. It's as old-fashioned and all-American as apple pie. Sales are soaring, and wait until you see what's selling. Anything red, white, and blue. Like the flag, if it's made in the USA, see why it's flying off the store shelves. The story tomorrow on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. On the CBS Market Watch, the government reports a record drop in the U.S. trade deficit in September as the economic slowdown cut demand for imports. In a sign an economic recovery may be coming, the index of leading indicators rose for the month of October, in part reflecting rising stock prices. After yesterday's Wall Street advance, some investors took some profits today. The Dow closed down 75, the Nasdaq lost 53. Not long ago, a booming economy had many cities and states awash in money. When the boom evaporated, so did the surpluses. And now, as John Blackstone reports in tonight's Eye on America, governments are facing a new budget-busting expense no one saw coming. With the war on terrorism moving to a higher alert, the front line can be anywhere. But guarding so many potential targets is expensive. From nuclear power plants to the Golden Gate Bridge, Police officers are now on duty around the clock, and overtime costs are soaring. The state of California is spending an extra million dollars a day for security, much of it on highway patrol overtime. Freedom isn't free, and the price we have to pay to protect our freedoms and our, our, our way of life are very high. As in almost everything since September 11th, New York has had a particular burden. New York State has asked the federal government for $100 million to pay for new security measures. But no place, it seems, can avoid spending to prepare for the worst. Given the current trends, uh, we will easily exhaust the $2.6 billion reserve that was in the 0102 budget. The state of Maryland needs to find $20 million for new security, so it's severely cutting other spending. What we'll do is uh, no new hires. One and a half percent reduction and a deferral of some construction contracts. The small airport in Santa Fe, New Mexico, handles only a dozen commercial flights a day, but its security costs have risen by a thousand dollars a day. Upgrading security for water systems will cost the nation 150 million dollars, and in San Francisco, there's a new expense for every ship passing through the Golden Gate. To protect the bridges and the bay, the Coast Guard has called up the reserves, creating a new armed security force, the Sea Marshals. Twelve miles outside the Golden Gate, armed Coast Guard officers board freighters, tankers, and cruise ships. They're among 2,700 reservists called to active duty, costing the Coast Guard almost a million dollars a day. The bottom line is to prevent the ship itself from becoming a, a weapon of mass destruction, if you will. In Salt Lake City, the security budget for the Winter Olympics has risen to $300 million. In all, American cities will spend $1.5 billion over the next year for protection against terrorism, a new expense for government at every level. When people really want government is in an emergency, which is what we have now. We're in a state of war. Well, all the extra security comes with a price tag. These days, no one is questioning the value. In San Francisco, John Blackstone for Eye on America. Microsoft said today it has agreed to pay more than a billion dollars to settle most of the private antitrust lawsuits filed against it. Under the plan, which still must be approved by a federal judge, Microsoft would distribute the money to about 12,500 needy schools nationwide. <laughs>
In tonight's CBS Evening News, in notes, President Bush today named Justice Department headquarters in Washington for the late Robert F. Kennedy. He served as Attorney General from 1961 to 64. At a ceremony attended by the Kennedy family, the President praised Kennedy's war against organized crime and his support for civil rights. The assassinated Robert Kennedy would have turned 76 today. A dubious distinction for New York City, the Census Bureau reported today that workers here spend more time commuting to their jobs than any other workers in the country, 39 minutes on average. And in Chicago, the U.S. Navy's appeal to invite a recruit to Thanksgiving dinner is a big success. In fact, so many people have responded, the Navy says it has run out of sailors. And it's anchor away here till tomorrow when we invite you to join us again for the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, CBS.com on the Internet and on our interactive partner, America Online, at keyword CBS News. Wait until you see what's selling this holiday season tomorrow. Experience CBS News. Attention all stations concerned. We are standing by for a possible update of tonight's CBS Evening News. Military muscle on the move. U.S. gunships and hundreds of Marines get ready to join the battle to finish off the Taliban leadership and its foreign terrorists. A possible new case of inhalation anthrax, this time in Connecticut. Ten weeks after the Twin Towers fell, danger still rises from the rubble. And President Bush puts out the welcome mat for tourists, but...